All right, good morning and welcome. And thank you to Jamil Art Center for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, and thank you all for coming this morning. I'm Bill Bragan. I'm the Executive Artistic Director of the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi. And uh, just to start before I go back, since this is really supposed to be about sort of career path and how I got to where I am, uh, I want to start with just showing a quick video about the Art Center. It's just one minute, uh, and I'll talk over it and sort of explain a little bit about what we do as you're watching the video. So if you can, please start the video, and I'm going to stand to the side here. That is Blinky Bill from Just a Band. So uh, all of these are photos from uh, events that we've done in the past nine years. We're in the ninth season of the Art Center. We are a multidisciplinary performing arts center, music, dance, theater, film, a lot of hybrid work. Uh, we really are focusing on creating a contemporary performing arts center that is about bringing community together with arts at the center of the conversation. We are presenting work from the UAE, from the region, and from around the world, and really trying to spark uh, inspiration and creativity and do it in dialogue with the university at NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, all of the artists who come, come on a residency model. They are visiting classes, but we're also having public schools from primary to middle school to high school, as well as homeschoolers. We we are having workshops that are open to the general public to really help to develop the skills of artists in the community as well as arts chats to really talk about the careers and career path in the community. So um, you saw just before that our tagline is come curious, leave inspired. And that is also uh, something that's really speaking to what the Art Center uh, positions as, uh, as our focus, which is we want to be a place for discovery. We are presenting artists and art forms that are often not really known by many of our audience. I think in the UAE, audiences are coming from so many different places with so many different levels of experience with different kinds of arts. Uh, I always say that if you look through our website, which is nyuad-artcenter.org, or if you look on our Instagram feed and you don't recognize any of the artists or you read the description and you can't quite understand what the show is, that's not your shortcoming, that's actually by design. We really are trying to be a place for innovation and a place for, for discovery. And so the invitation is to come with an open mind and the promise is that hopefully you'll come away inspired by what you see. Um, as a curator, I'm the executive artistic director of the Art Center uh, and uh, I have been here from the beginning of the program, which is about nine years now. We're in our ninth season. Uh, and it's really an extension of what I've done my entire career. Uh, which I trace back to in my social media handle, I sort of say uh, semi tongue in cheek, semi not, uh, imposing my taste on friends and strangers since 19, whatever, whatever. Uh, and, then I, and then I use a Brazilian phrase that was used in an article about me, uh, which described me as a uh, instiga uh, instigador cultural, a, a cultural instigator. Uh, and I trace what I do as the, I'm both the executive director, which is, means I'm overseeing sort of the business side of the, of the program, and artistic director, which means I'm overseeing the sort of curatorial vision. Uh, and I've got my colleagues, Reem Alam and Reem Saleh, both here, who work with me on all of those things and all the outreach. Uh, but I trace what I do, particularly on the curatorial side, to who I was when I was a probably middle schooler, where I would have friends over in my bedroom and I would pull out a record that I had just heard and I was like, this is amazing, you should listen to this. And I'm playing a record for them and then before that record has even ended, I'm like, oh wait, and that reminds me of this other thing. And I would take that record out and put it on. And that sort of sense of passion that sense of wanting to share my passion with other people, that sense of uh, discovery in real time, and that sense of bullying my friends into listening to what I want them to listen to. I think all of those, all of those things were really in place when I was a teenager. Uh, I was a musician growing up. My father is a professional musician and a music educator, so music was always in the household. My mother was an amateur pianist and also worked a little bit on my dad's business. Uh, and he also uh, always had three jobs. He taught instrumental music in the schools, he gave private lessons, and he played the sort of wedding and bar mitzvah circuit on the weekends. So also, I think, from a very early age, I sort of understood that a pursuit and a life in the arts is days, nights, and weekends, that the sort of boundary between your personal love and your passion and your profession 
is very, very, very fluid. It also meant that uh, I know that there are lots of people who need to make a case to their parents for why they could pursue their passion in the arts. I was lucky enough that I didn't have to do that. They understood immediately because it was because of my parents that, that I had these kinds of interests. Uh, I grew up playing trumpet and playing in the concert band and the orchestra and the jazz band and singing in the choir and being in musical theater productions and things like that. When I got to college, I went to a small liberal arts college uh, outside of Philadelphia. And during that orientation week, they had, the, uh, they had all the extracurricular fair. And there was a campus radio station, and there was a campus concert series. And so I signed up for both of those. And I still remember the first concert I worked on was a, uh, an avant-garde jazz group called Willembroeke Collectif from the Netherlands. Uh, and it was a big band that was sort of inspired by Duke Ellington and Count Basie, but it was also inspired by free improvisation. And they were doing extended technique and making sounds and noises with their instruments that I'd never heard before. I'd never seen anything played like that before. And it kind of blew my mind. And again, that sense of discovery was really important even then. Uh, tickets for those shows were free for all the students. And so people would come again like me, most people had never heard that kind of music, and it was super exciting. Uh, the next concert after that was a duet uh, with Craig Harris and Ronald Shannon Jackson. It was a trombone and drums duet, not a very typical format. Again, it was music I had never heard before. I remember I got invited out for dinner with the, uh, with the artists and a couple of the other people who worked on the concert committee, and I remember sitting there thinking, this is so cool. I just saw this mind-blowing concert uh, that was music I had never imagined. And then I got to go out for dinner, and I felt very fancy. Uh, dinner ended, and it was time for them to take their van back to New York, uh, where they were from, about an hour and a half away. Uh, we get to where their van is parked on a lawn, and it has sunk into the mud. And so after feeling really fancy about being at this dinner, we all had to get behind the van and push it out of the mud. And I think, again, for me, that was really important to go through that full range of understanding all of the hard work that goes in behind the scenes that actually are just as important and the relationship with the artists and helping them not only to share their art on stage, but helping them backstage when they're in a little bit of a crisis. Uh, so I ended up working on that concert series for about four years. Uh, and that was really where I got to develop my own interest as a curator and to look at how I could share my passions, impose my taste on my fellow students as well as people from outside the university. Uh, I became a real fan of the fact that uh, that tickets were free for students. So the idea of keeping the barriers away, which is something that's really important for us at the Art Center as well, and has been throughout my career. Uh, and then I also had my coursework, which I took on the side. I was a sociology major. I looked at uh, sociology of popular culture, but uh, I was also looking at issues of race and power and sociology of deviance and social structures and class, and really looking at the way society worked originally thinking that that was separate from what I was doing in my extracurriculars. Uh, I had some summer internships. I took classes first. I did take some classes in sociology of popular culture. I took a history of jazz. There was a class that probably changed my life, which was a class in the music of Frank Zappa. And it became really a survey of 20th century experimental music and introduced me to so much of the music that I'm most passionate about. Uh, this past uh, week at the Art Center, we presented the Philip Glass Ensemble, presenting uh, a live score to the film Keanu Scotzi. That was a film that was a film and that was a composer. I really discovered in high school and college and changed the way I thought about art. And so even that, those early influences continue to impact what I'm doing today. Uh, and then I had some other internships. So I worked at a not-for-profit record distributor that was artist-run record labels, uh, a mixture of early experimental electronic music, jazz, both straight ahead and free jazz, uh, Afrobeat, uh, experimental music of all kinds. And I think that working in a record distributor, which is about bringing the work to the marketplace, but also with a mission of supporting independent artists who are trying to take control of their own careers, uh, and working in that space in between the sort of for-profit and not-for-profit sector has also been, I think, a big influence on me. I also then had a summer internship at uh, 
at a waterfront, not unlike here, a waterfront center in Philadelphia that presented jazz festivals and ethnic cultural festivals that had food and crafts and music. So also, again, that question of a public civic space that is supporting uh, the meeting ground of people from a specific community, but sharing their culture with people from outside the community and creating that common space. Also at the same time, as an audience member, I think one of the most important things for me in terms of the career in the arts is about the job of being an audience, going to festivals, especially, again, free to the public festivals. I spent a lot of time in the summers in Central Park in New York City at Central Park Summer Sage. It was a place that presented music and dance and theater and spoken word. Uh, it. Uh, its curatorial approach was to mac match artists from very different traditions on the same bill. So the audience is also mixed. So you might have Sun Rock, sort of pioneering jazz artist on the bill with Sonic Youth, the, the influential post-punk band. You might have Coco Taylor, an incredible blues singer on the bill with Tito Puente, one of the pioneers of mambo and salsa. And so that was a place that I went for my own discovery. It's where I saw contemporary dance for the first time. It's where I saw spoken word artists collaborating with musicians for the first time. And it was really, I think, my model for what can happen, again, if you make it easy for people to attend the arts, if you take away barriers of cost, but also if you, you take away the barriers of tradition. I think a lot of times people feel like, oh, I don't know about contemporary art. I don't know about jazz, therefore maybe I shouldn't go to it because I won't be able to appreciate it. My experience as an audience member has always been you show up and you discover and you talk to the people next to you in the audience and you learn from them. You start to see what other people are responding to. You start to form your own opinions and it goes deeper and deeper. And that is an ethos that has continued to be part of my work ever since. Uh, when I was graduating from college, uh, there, were, there were really two places that I applied to work. One was Central Park Summer Sage because it had been so important in my own development. And the other one was a company called Festival Productions. Festival Productions was founded by George Ween, uh, who created the first Newport Jazz Festival. It's really considered sort of the birthplace of the modern summer music festival. It, uh, it led to the Newport Folk Festival. It led to Woodstock. It led to the Glastonbury Festival. It led to the Roskilde Festival. It led to kind of the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival which they also produced, and was really the place, again, that, uh, that created a place for people to go and to explore a lot of different music on multiple stages that's well curated, that is priced well. And ultimately, I ended up working for Festival Productions out of school, uh, working on both free festivals, uh, Latin and urban music festivals that was sponsored by Miller Beer, and then uh, working eventually on corporate marketing programs for American Express. Uh, as somebody who had been a sociology major, this was in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and corporate sponsorship was not yet really kind of understood or appreciated, and I had my own hesitation about that. But what I learned in that part of my job was that I learned what the sponsor's interests were. I learned why they would fund a music festival. I learned how to talk, how to create a presentation. I learned all of the sort of business skills that in the executive director part of my job now are actually really central. Being able to talk to a sponsor and say, we've got this incredible property, is what they, what, what they would say. Uh, it's almost as bad as saying content. Uh, but you know, we could say, we've got this incredible festival, we have a loyal audience, we know how to connect you to the audience, and we understand what your needs are, as whether it's as a philanthropist or as a, a marketing division, and we can help to marry them. And so, a lot of my career since then has been taking, I think, this 15-year-old version of myself in my, kind of in my bedroom, sharing my passions, trying to bring it to people with not as an expert, I don't think of myself as an expert. I've seen thousands of concerts, so I've seen 
more shows than many people I know. I've listened to probably more records than many people I know, but I'm not an expert in any of the music. What I am is I'm a very eager fan, and, I'm, and I don't feel like I need to be an expert in order to share that passion with other people. But then from the marketing side, I also understand what it takes so that it could be funded and so that it could be presented to the public. Uh, Going on from there, because I have no idea where we are in, in terms of time, but I ended up going on after Central Park Summer Sage. Uh, so I left Festival Productions, and I finally got a job at Central Park Summer Sage. And I got a job at Central Park Summer Sage because on all of my free days, that's where I was hanging out. I got to know the people who were working there. They got to know me. They saw that I was very present. I saw what they did. Uh, and so... Working at New York University in Abu Dhabi, one of the conversations I have with a lot of our students as they're getting ready to graduate and they're thinking about career path and what to do, my first, my first piece of advice is show up. If you're in the audience, A, you're learning about the art that they're presenting, B, you're seeing how they work, C, you're meeting the people who work there, uh, and when I interview people, one of the questions is also, have you been to the Art Center before? What do you know about our work? I think that sense of connection is really critically important. And almost every job that I've gotten since then has been based on an invitation. It was not blind applying to a job. It was somebody who worked in an organization that knew about an opening, that knew me, that knew my interests, that knew my passions, and then invited me to apply. So the showing up is really important. Uh, so I went to Central Park Summer Sage. From there, I was at Joe's Pub at the Public Theater, which was a 180-seat nightclub that was part of the organization that started the free Shakespeare in Central Park. Again, this idea of free access. Joseph Papp, who is the Joe that Joe's Pub is named after, uh, he had the belief that theater should be free like books are in the library. And again, that idea that you can really expand the culture if you take away the barriers. From there, I went to Lincoln Center, uh, where I oversaw free community uh, multidisciplinary performing arts and social dance festivals. And then I got invited to apply for the role at NYU Abu Dhabi. All of those I see very much as a sort of as a continuum uh, that is based on that sense of passion, but also again that that belief that the arts are important for much more than the art itself. It's also about the community building. I think a lot of the work and what was exciting about coming to the UAE, where I look around the room and I see a group of people who are from very, very different backgrounds coming from New York, that is a value that's really important to me. And the way that getting people into the same space to share an experience creates a common history, a common culture. It creates opportunities for people to share the arts and culture from their own background with other people who are encountering it for the first time. It's one of those things that also, I think, from my training as a sociologist, I really think about community empowerment and community building and how you can create a place. So when the UAE has really focused on developing the arts and culture ecosystem and building museums like Jamil Art Center and al Sarkal Avenue uh, and, uh, and Dubai Opera and then Abu Dhabi, all of the places upstairs, the Art Center, Cultural Foundation, 421, all of those I think the investment in creating an identity that will unify people who are coming from all over the world with the arts at the center of that process is something that has been really a huge inspiration to me. Uh, I think I'll stop there, if, unless there's somebody who, who can give me a clue, or I'm also happy to take questions, or I could keep talking. Uh, yeah. Okay, if you can, is there another microphone that we can use for the audience? That would be great. Thanks. <clears throat> yes, hello, my name is Paulina. I'm a professional musician. I'm a singer-songwriter. I have uh, several am albums out. Uh, it's indie music. I think in it's interesting for art crowd. So can I present uh, somehow my work uh, for you just to take into account and maybe cooperate in future? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the things, in terms of like the nuts and bolts of what it means to be a curator, part of it is to, is to explore a lot of art by artists that you don't know. Uh, I think that there is this sort of mythology that, uh, that people don't have time or aren't interested. So much of my work has been by 
just listening to music or watching links of dance or theater pieces that just sort of come in through the email, and that's how we get to know people. Uh, and I've done a lot of work. Uh, we actually, we see Benedict back there who is part of uh, a program for artists called NAMU, an artist development training program that, that, we've, uh, that we've created at the Art Center that is really also about helping to train artists to kind of pursue that. And one of the sessions that Reem and I did was about what it's like, like the relationship between the artist and the curator and what we're looking for. Uh, and yeah, and I think that exchange is really important. So uh, nyuad.artscenter, arts plural, center the US spelling uh, at nyu.edu is the email to send that to. Yeah, and we have lots of programs for artists at various levels. So. We have a lot of international artists that are people that we see at festivals, at conferences, and other places, people that we've worked with in other places that we're inviting. We have programs like Rooftop Rhythms, which is gonna be uh, uh, presenting events and open mics later today. That is a place for community-based artists. And these are people who are both very, very active experience artists who are just trying to kind of get a new audience or try out new material. Uh, and it's people who are getting on stage for the first time. And it's uh, spoken word and poetry, but it's also original music. And then we've got Hekaya, our UAE National Day event, where we have a team of curators who are each nominating artists, again, at different levels of their career that is designed to represent all the different communities who want to celebrate UAE National Day. So uh, yeah, there are lots of different ways for it. So I look forward to seeing it. And yeah, one more question, and then I think we're, we're going to be out of time after that. But thank you. I see you almost uh, speaking about the music and performances. But you also uh, told about crafts workshop. And do you have some art workshops? So. So the art center is focused specifically on performing arts. We have colleagues, and they have a booth upstairs as well, which is the NYUAD Art Gallery, and they're focusing up more on visual art. Uh, the they don't do as much workshops for artists, although within the university, in the curriculum for students, there's visual arts, there's theater, there's interactive media, there's music, uh, and there's film. So uh, and some of I those do, do workshops. They are up on the third floor, so go visit the art gallery. There is There are two spaces that the art gallery has. One is a museum. They do kind of three, four month major exhibitions. Where on the thir uh, third floor? It, it, of, of Jamil Art Center, right here. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, and then they have the project space, which is a space that's designed for shorter term shows, for community-based artists, as well as student and faculty work as well. Uh, and I think that we're out of time, but I thank you all for coming here early on a Sunday morning. Uh, I want to thank, once again, I want to thank Jamil Art Center. And uh, I will be out in the lobby and happy to have uh, any kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations. Thanks so much. My name is Arnold Barreto. I am a visual artist and a, um, I'm a photographer, graphic designer, printmaker, and a book artist. Um, I also work at Golf Photo Plus. Uh, currently, I am their shop manager, so I manage their photo books, the editions, um, the, um, the film, the film developing, and literally anything that's uh, related to the shop of Golf Photo Plus. Um, I have notes. I put it away into my pocket. Uh, but. So I'm filling in for Raz, who is our general manager, who unfortunately is sick um, and couldn't be here today. Uh, so yeah, um, I know this talk is about industry experts and their success in the career. Uh, and I feel like I'm very much at the starting point for myself in that zone. Uh, so I'm going to keep this a little bit casual. You know, If anyone has questions, feel free to interrupt any time. Um, so yeah, um, we'll have questions, time for questions in the end as well. But for now, just a little bit of background on me before I get into what I do at Golf Photo Plus. So I grew up in the UAE. Uh, I'm originally from India, but I lived most of my life here. And I went to a school in uh, the UAE as well. And the school did not have any emphasis on arts. There's no arts education. Uh, it was very rudimentary, uh, and I'm no, I know a lot of people who grew up here have the same experience. So um, 
even though I didn't have any education in the arts, I was also always just passionate about it. So I uh, taught myself how to paint, um, taught myself how to draw. Um, but eventually I did end up going to college and I went to college for, in the US for graphic design because I wanted to make money, um, which didn't work out as well for me in the sense of like, I got there, I was like, I love doing this, but this is not it for me. So I started uh, taking classes in photography, printmaking, book arts, and that's kind of where I found my niche. Um, when I was in college, I tried everything. So I was uh, in theater, I did a lot of theater shows. Uh, I applied for any uh, exhibition that was open. Um, I worked in the museum, I worked in the art department. I literally threw myself against the wall and just like, oh, I can do that, let me try it. Uh, and that kind of really perpetuated throughout my career and it kind of really helped me get to where I am right now. Um, I really fell in love with photography and printmaking, uh, but I still got my degree in graphic design, because um, <laughs> um, But yeah, so after that, I um, started also uh, interning at a design uh, publication, uh, which was uh, a local magazine. Uh, started designing for them, and then eventually became uh, their uh, art director for a, a little bit, for a few seasons. Um, that was really uh, an interesting experience because it was still under the college, but we were still facilitating this uh, magazine that goes around on the Boston Airlines and um, was really a key point of tourism for the, for the local region. Um, so that was the first time I also like handled a team uh, and working with the team and how to delegate responsibilities when um, you know, as you're, as you're a visual artist, you tend to uh, focus a lot on your own work and you tend to work, um, it's different for everybody, but for me particularly as a visual artist, I tend to focus on working on things myself, a uh, lot less collaboration. Uh, but this was the first time that I had to experience that collaboration outside of theater, outside of uh, a classroom environment. Um, Literally after that, uh, I graduated from college. I was trying to find where to uh, place myself. Um, and I moved to New York City um, and applied again for every single internship. But my key internship was at Aperture Foundation, which is a nonprofit um, publication. Uh, and they do photo books, they do magazines. Um, and it was the perfect fit for me because I knew graphic design wasn't it, but I wanted to work in tangent and I had all of these skills. So I wanted to go into a publication where I could use these skills to highlight other people's work. Um, I ended up getting uh, the, uh, the, the, the program and it was a six month long internship uh, in the production department so I really was handling the books there. So I got to work on a few magazines um, but this was in 2020 so COVID happened right around the corner uh, cutting short the internship and I had to move back uh, to UAE. Um, and at the time um, because I grew up in the UAE, I had a very different experience of living in the UAE in the arts world compared to now. Uh, I didn't have the resources, right? So my understanding of the art world in the UAE was that there was almost nothing. Um, so when I had to move back, I was like, what am I going back to? I had no idea what I was going back to. Jamil wasn't a thing that was present in my head. al Sarkal wasn't a thing that was present in my head. Even though they existed, it was not something that was accessible to me. Um, so that was a big, big point of contention. A lot of my work also de deals with intimacy and love and spaces uh, that holds these kind of intimacies. So that also was kind of a nifty, uh, iffy subject of uh, how do I work in a space um, that has a lot of uh, limitations or um, just boundaries, you know? Um, so moving back was really stressful. It was really um, a confusing time. Also, we were dealing with the, uh, with the pandemic. Um, so I ended up taking a job in graphic design because I was like, that's a thing that is easily accessible. Uh, it's a thing that I can fall into easily. Uh, I have the skills for it. So, and there is positions for it, you know, like that's easily accessible. Um, ended up hating it. Uh, the job, like quite a few jobs in UAE, tend to be or was um, a mixed bag of everything. You do, if you're a creative in the field, you end up getting all of the creative jobs, um, especially in smaller organizations. Um, so I was doing everything. I was managing their podcasts, I was doing their uh, graphic design, I was making content, I was recording stuff. Uh, and 
the minute I, like, the first week in there, I was like, I don't like this job. I need to quit. <laughs> um, and my nice little Indian parents were like, no, it's fine. You don't, you don't know. Like, you know, sometimes jobs are hard. And I was like, okay, jobs are hard. And so I just, I stuck with it. Uh, but I knew that was not the place for me. Um, throughout this time, I was still working as a full-time artist. Um, I know some people would consider it as a part-time artist if you're not working, if that's not your full-time job, but like, for me personally, I'm always thinking about my art, I'm always thinking about my work, and I'm always trying to make time to make it work, so I feel like I'm still a full-time artist even though I have a full-time job. Uh, so, during that time, I was going to Gulf Photo Plus in Al Sarkal, because that was the only place that developed film, and I am a film shooter, so I went there and I was like dropping off my film. I was making friends with uh, Yulia at the time who was working the front desk and then somebody else came in, Ben, and I was making friends with them. I did not know anybody else in the company, just those two people. Um, but they kind of became uh, my point of contact into the company. Um, when I left uh, my last job, it was kind of like destiny that a position opened up at GPP. Uh, so I applied to it uh, not expecting anything, and it was not even a position that was creative. It was a front desk position, uh, so it was almost like a glorified receptionist plus extra task. Um, and that was really the best thing for me at the time because I realized that I do not want to make art for anybody else. Like, I want to make art for myself, and I'm willing to give myself to another job, but in a different capacity, even if it's a creative job. I want to give it <laughs> to a different capacity. So in this way, I started to think about how much of myself to give away and how much of myself to keep to myself. Um, and that's something that I feel like as artists, we need to really figure out if we're working in a way that we want to give ourselves to another person uh, or another company. and how much do we reserve for ourselves? Again, there is no right or wrong answer for that. You can be a creative, you can be a fine artist, you can be a commercial artist. Um, it's figuring out that little scope. And so for me, for two years, I did not want to make art for anybody else. I just wanted to work on my stuff for myself, reserve that energy for the work that I'm making for myself, uh, and then give a different part of myself away to an organization. Um, and so, I was lucky that this organization is based in photography and they knew my work and they appreciated my work and they were also um, kind of creating that space for me too. Um, when I applied for that job, uh, initially it was a part-time position and I got the call back and he, uh, the boss, our boss uh, Samji, um, said that I don't want to give you the job because you deserve something full-time. Um, and I was really kind of taken aback and I was really sad because I knew I was qualified for it. Um, but that was what I had to deal with. And then luckily when uh, a position that was full-time opened up, that's when they called me. So I really think it's very key, just as Bill said, uh, of just like going and showing up to places, uh, doing things that you might not think you would want to do, just, uh, or you might not be comfortable doing, but just throwing yourself into it uh, really helps. Um, this year I've started doing a lot of uh, workshops because I have all of these skills and I, uh, there's not a lot of people who do the same things that I do, and it's really fascinating just to throw myself into that to teach people how to do these things, um, because that has led to other things. You know, even if it's if you're doing something that you might think, oh, I should probably get paid more for this, or I should probably do something that actually like is more specific to my craft. Uh, sometimes things lead to something else. Um, yeah, um, now I work in Gulf Photo Plus and I'm now managing uh, two people under me. Uh, I am the shop manager, so as I mentioned, like I uh, manage the photo books, which involves reaching out to artists in the region and seeing, oh, you ha are a wonderful artist. You have this book that is not being sold at these large-scale publications or even uh, uh, at these uh, bookshops or getting lost in these bookshops. How do we make these books accessible? How do we make these books uh, very uh, personal to you or reach a wider audience through our organization. Um, so yeah, th those are some of the things that I'm doing at Gulf Photo Plus. I'm also in uh, SEEF at the moment, so the Salama bin Hamdan Emerging Artist Fellowship. Um, so my time, of course, uh, right now is like, during the week, I'm working at GPP. During the weekends, I'm at SEEF uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and finding that balancing act uh, is difficult, but it's something that you have to uh, figure out 
how to do and how much of yourself you want to give away. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, so that's a very quick uh, introduction slash um, explanation of what I do. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. I don't know how much time we have. So. Anything about GPP as well? I'm happy to answer any questions about the photography organization as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you guys for listening to my little talk. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you.